Today on the Perception and Action Podcast, a look at the equilibrium point hypothesis of motor control. How can movements be controlled both actively and reactively? So it's time for a call to action. Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I want to look at the equilibrium point hypothesis and how it ties into several of the concepts I've been discussing on the podcast. A question that has intrigued many since we first started thinking about the control of movements is whether they are produced in an active way, by a will, an intention, or even a soul, or in a reactive way, as a response to signals from the environment. This issue has been debated since the times of Plato and Aristotle, and has continued to be central to a lot of the contrasting views in modern motor control research that I've discussed on the podcast. For example, motor programs versus reflexes, model-based versus online control, information processing versus the ecological approach, etc., etc., As we will soon see, the equilibrium point hypothesis combines principles from these two camps, bringing together reflex and motor program theories. Much of it is based off the ideas of Sir Charles Sherrington, who viewed muscle reflexes not as hardwired stereotypical responses to stimuli, but rather as tunable mechanisms that form the basis of motor behavior. Control of movements, according to Sherrington, was performed by changing parameters of reflexes, in particular the tonic stretch reflex, an idea very close to what we'll see in the equilibrium point hypothesis. At the same time, this hypothesis captures the idea that voluntary movements are controlled by pattern generators stored in memory, an idea first proposed by Bernstein, what he called engrams, and later expanded by Richard Schmidt in terms of motor programs. So now that I've whetted your appetite, let's have a look at the equilibrium point or EP hypothesis of movement control. The EP hypothesis was developed in the 1960s by Anatole Feldman and colleagues. Remember, the goal of this hypothesis is to explain how we can control movement both actively or voluntarily to achieve our particular goal and reactively in response to a change in the environment. Quote, from the biophysical viewpoint, motor actions result from shifts in the equilibrium state that the organism and the environment tend to achieve in the process of the mutual interaction. Such shifts can be elicited voluntarily by the organism or involuntarily following changes in environmental forces. It is essential to emphasize that the equilibrium state is conditioned by both the organism and the environment, and therefore the organism can only influence but not entirely predetermine it. The environment is an equal player in achieving this state. End quote. To achieve this end, the EP hypothesis brings together several major principles. The first is the concept of threshold control. As first shown by Matthews in 1959, our muscles have a threshold value for muscle length. If the muscle length is below or shorter than this threshold value, the muscle remains silent. But if the length is above or longer than this threshold, the muscle gets activated. Specifically, the muscle is shortened through the process of contraction so as to bring the actual length closer to the threshold length. This occurs through the activation of motor neurons and muscle fibers. The size of this contraction depends on how far the actual length of the muscle, sensed by our proprioceptive senses in our body, is from the threshold value. Where this comes from we'll get to in a second. One of the main ways in which Feldman expanded on this basic threshold idea was to introduce a second variable, force. Imagine you're holding a 500 newton dumbbell and your arm is completely still. In this situation, your biceps muscle is in a steady state, which can be described by two variables, force, which is equal and opposite to the external load of 500 newtons, and the muscle length. So force is determined by the load we are holding. Where does the muscle length come from? In the EP hypothesis, a control signal, called lambda, sent to the muscle from the brain, sets the threshold value of the tonic stretch reflex. In other words, it sets the relationship between force and muscle length that I mentioned a few moments ago. Think of a graph with force on the y-axis and length on the x-axis. This control parameter determines the position of the curve that relates these two variables. For example, the curve could be all the way to the left side of the graph so that a relatively large amount of force can be generated by a short muscle length, or it could be all the way to the right side so that a large amount of force involves a long muscle length. 
Again, I will get to why you might want to change this in a second. The main consequence of this arrangement is that for any set of environmental conditions, the muscle will settle into a steady state equilibrium point, thus the name of the hypothesis. With all else staying the same, any deviation from this point, for example a decrease in muscle length, will lead to a movement of the system back towards the equilibrium point. This movement towards equilibrium serves as a postural stabilizing mechanism. Another way to think of it is that our muscles are trying to achieve the minimal amount of activation that is compatible with the external forces they are facing. This is called the principle of end state action. Okay, now that we've described the steady state, let's consider how we can get movement in the system. This can actually occur in two ways. First, imagine we switch the dumbbell so that's now only 250 newtons, so lighter, with all else being the same. In this situation, at the old equilibrium point, the muscle force being generated by the current length of your muscle, which remember is determined by the control parameter lambda, is more than is needed for this new dumbbell. Therefore, the muscle will be contracted and the system will move towards a new equilibrium point. This is essentially a movement along the same force length curve. The second way movement can occur is if we send a new descending signal down from our motor cortex to the muscles, changing the control parameter lambda. Let's call this a change from lambda 1 to lambda 2. This change will result in a positional shift in the muscle force muscle length curve. Imagine for example we shift the curve to the left, so that shorter muscle lengths are required to produce the same forces. Now let's go back to our original example of holding a 500 newton dumbbell. The force is still the same, but the muscle length that used to be at our equilibrium point would now generate a force much greater than we need with the new control signal lambda 2. So this change will again result in a contraction or shortening of our muscle so that the system moves towards a new equilibrium point. However, unlike the case with the external load change, this is not a movement along the same curve but rather a jump to an entirely new one. So by incorporating these two principles, threshold control and movement towards an equilibrium into the EPI hypothesis, we can get both active and reactive movements. In the simple bicep example, movements or changes in the state of our muscles can be consequences of some change in the external load. Since this change is the result of something happening in the external environment that is out of our control, it can be considered to be reflexive or involuntary. But at the same time, we can get movement in the system by deliberately changing the control parameter lambda which of course is an active or voluntary movement. I don't want to get into too much detail about it, but this simple model can also be extended to describing systems of two muscles. For example, if we now have a pair of muscles with opposing forces, an extensor and a flexor, in this case each muscle has its own control variable lambda f for the flexor and lambda e for the extensor. And now instead of a simple force, we have an external torque acting on the system. But the same basic principles apply. A movement in the system will occur either when the external torque changes or the values of the control parameters are changed voluntarily. But in this case, the system has even more flexibility in terms of voluntary movements. For example, both lambdas could be changed, one could be changed, or one could be increased while the other is decreased. This can result in a variety of different effects, from shifts in the torque length curve similar to the bicep example I just described, to changes in joint stiffness. And this can all be in turn scaled up for a whole body movement by setting a larger set of lambda values. Okay, so now we've described the steady state where the system is at an equilibrium point and movements to a new equilibrium point caused by either voluntary or involuntary means. How now do we get to making complex movements? To achieve this, we need to introduce another essential concept within the EP hypothesis, the control trajectory. The control trajectory describes how our control parameters change over time. Returning to the simple bicep example, imagine at time 1 we have a control parameter lambda 1. As we have discussed, the system will reach an equilibrium. It will come to rest at an equilibrium point corresponding to a combination of muscle length and force defined by lambda 1 and the external load. Now imagine at time 2 we set a new control parameter value of lambda 2. This will cause the system to move to a new equilibrium point. Therefore, if we want a body segment like our arm to move through a complex trajectory, this can be achieved by setting a series of different control parameters for different points in time. A control trajectory, which we could call lambda t, is essentially a time sequence of equilibrium points, which incorporate length, 
and force changes in the muscle. A couple important points about this idea of the control trajectory. First, while the control trajectory is assumed to be specified centrally in our motor cortex, the actual resultant equilibrium trajectory emerges with an equally important role played by the external force field. If a movement is practiced against a constant external load, repeating the same control pattern, the same control trajectory, can be expected to lead to the same equilibrium trajectory, but only if the load does not change. Generating the same control trajectory against a changing load would result in a different equilibrium trajectory. If this is making you think of repetition without repetition, then you are totally getting it. The same exact control trajectory sent to our muscles will not result in the same movement outcome. This is Bernstein's problem of context condition variability, which I discussed back in episode 93. The other key point about using a control trajectory to control movements is that it does not require that we have an internal model of the limb dynamics and external forces. Instead of having to specify the exact lengths and positions of the muscles at each point in time, in the EP hypothesis, a higher level control parameter, lambda, which specifies the length-force relationship, is used. The muscle lengths that result and how they are achieved are determined at the level of the spinal cord and the muscles themselves, as they have all the necessary information about the system's state to reach an equilibrium point. Before wrapping up today's episode and discussing some implications of the EP hypothesis, I want to talk a little bit about how it connects with another important concept, muscle synergies. Recall the concept of motor abundance I discussed in episode 135. When faced with a task that involves controlling a large number of degrees of freedom, the system does not look for a single solution, but rather organizes the interaction between the elements of the system in a manner such that families of solutions emerge, all capable of achieving the task goal. This organization is partially achieved through muscle synergies, where degrees of freedom of movement are not controlled independently, but rather compensate for each other. As discussed in detail by Mark Latash, this EP hypothesis captures the basic idea of muscle synergies. Quote, the tonic stretch reflex mechanism is an example of a feedback system that adjusts the rates of the action potential generation by the individual motor units, stabilizing the total level of muscle activation. End quote. So, to sum up, in the equilibrium point hypothesis, movements are generated by the nervous system through a gradual transition of equilibrium points along a desired trajectory. In most cases, the equilibrium point will be a state where the internal muscle forces are balanced with the external forces impinging on the system from the environment. In other words, a net zero force. Equilibrium point control involves threshold control in that signals sent from the central nervous system to the periphery alter the threshold length of each muscle. Motor neurons send commands to the muscle which change the force length relationship within a muscle, resulting in a shift of the system's equilibrium point. Like all theories, the EP hypothesis is not without its critics. One of the main issues that has been raised is that it's difficult to test experimentally. However, it has been successfully applied to robotics and understanding some movement disorders. What does all this mean for coaching? Well, if we take these ideas at an abstract level, I think there's some key points. Any biological system will tend towards an equilibrium if the conditions remain constant. This equilibrium serves to minimize energy or achieve comfort. If we want to kick the system out of its equilibrium, which of course is what we're trying to do in most practice activities, this can be achieved in two main ways. First, by encouraging a change in the voluntary control of the system, or change in the control parameter lambda in the EP model, for example. Connecting with the ideas I've discussed in the podcast, this amounts to a change in intent in the athlete. The other way we can move the system out of its equilibrium is by altering the external forces. This is, of course, why I and many others continue to emphasize the importance of variability of practice conditions. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including an extra monthly episode and written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. <laughs>